This is Duke University. David once told me he thought of his life as coming in three chapters. And I believe the first time I met you, David, uh, uh, and I know uh, w where and when it was, uh, was just as you were beginning to think you might be uh, uh, crossing the transition from chapter two to chapter three, you told me chapter one had to do with preparing yourself, chapter two had to do uh, with achieving uh, success in your career, and chapter three involved philanthropy or giving back. You know that David is one of the people who has signed along with Bill and Melinda Gates, Duke alum, Warren Buffett, not Duke alum, <laughs> the, uh, the so-called giving pledge. Uh, but you know from being in Washington that this is a person who has figured out uh, that his personal success uh, has as a significant part of its value, that it puts him in the position to turn that success to account for the good of the world around him. He is the head of the board of the Kennedy Center, He's a trustee of the Smithsonian. Uh, he's vice chair of the board of Brookings. He's on more boards than I could name. One day, uh, I don't even know how this quite happened, he drifted into a room where an auction was taking place and he bought a copy of the Magna Carta that used to belong to Ross Perot. <laughs> Who was Ross Perot, some of you are saying. <laughs> Uh, which he then put on deposit at the National Archive. The only Magna Carta I ever saw was purchased by David Rubenstein and made available to this nation. He enjoyed that experience so much he bought an Emancipation Proclamation that is now on display at the White House and a Declaration of Independence that's now on display at the State Department. Uh, unless you think this is the limits of his philanthropy, remember he is still a young man, uh, he has also become increasingly active at Duke. He agreed to come on board as a trustee in 2005. In the intervening years, he has headed our trustee committee that has advised on international and global efforts. He, uh, this fall, became the vice chair of the board of trustees. Uh, I think last fall, he became the dad of a Duke student, the ultimate honor. Uh, he uh, has uh, been important. Everything we ask him to do, he does. This summer, he went to China to watch the Duke basketball team play. Uh, I have a picture of him. I have two pictures, one of which Yao Ming is taller than you, and in the other of which you are taller than Yao Ming. Uh, it was da David, you, you know if you have been on, uh, to the buildings of the Sanford, formerly Sanford Institute of Public Policy, that one of its buildings uh, was given by David, uh, and it was David who put the institute across the line for the financial goal that enabled it to become a school. And most recently, he has given us a sizable and wonderful gift to rebuild the uh, rare book and manuscript collection of uh, the, the Perkins Library. So this is a good friend of Duke. Uh, we welcome you in chapter two and one quarter of your life. Uh, come on up and let me ask you some hard questions. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. So David, here we, here we sit like Nixon and Mao. Right. <laughs> Uh, Who's which? Yeah. <laughs> I was just kind of running that possibility Thanks. through my mind. What do you want, you want to pick? Well, Nixon lived longer, but uh, Mao probably had more impact. So Mao uh, was the more, <laughs> Mao was the stronger swimmer, as we know. Uh, let me, well, okay, so here we are in the Kennedy Center, and we're here thanks to you, and, and you have uh, assumed a big role in the, li in the life of this place. Uh, can you tell us a little about, you know, I remember when JFK was president, there was no such thing as a center for the performing arts in Washington. The most famous theater in Washington was Ford Theater, and it was not principally famous for its theater. Right. <laughs> let, let me explain. Uh, how many people here have never been to the Kennedy Center? Anybody? All right. How many people here come regularly? Okay. That's the stuff. I mean, the, the history is quite interesting. I'll try to give it very briefly. Um, when Pierre L'Enfant was drawing up the plans for Washington, D.C., he included a kind of performance center, cultural center, and unfortunately, he was fired. So those plans never actually came to fruition. And so there was no government-sponsored kind of performing arts center, and so people like Mr. Ford put together Ford's Theater, and so entrepreneurs would build theaters and they would be named after them. Uh, there was nothing of any consequence like this, and uh, there was a push in Congress in the 1900s, 1930s, 40s to build a cultural center. 
Eleanor Roosevelt pushed for it very heavily. Uh, it, it didn't actually happen until 1958. And the reason it didn't honestly happen earlier was that there were some members of Congress who felt if the government put together a performing arts center, it would have to be integrated. And there were many, many members of Congress from certain areas of the, of the country who didn't really want an integrated performing arts center, to be honest. So it didn't happen until 1958 when President Eisenhower signed the legislation to authorize the National Cultural Center. Uh, it was all supposed to come from private sector money, uh, but in the three years that they worked on raising this money, only $13,000 was raised, not oh. enough to build anything. When President Kennedy came in, he appointed a man named Roger Stevens, a Broadway producer, to kind of jumpstart this effort. And they were making progress, but then President Kennedy was assassinated. Uh, within a month, the Congress renamed the National Cultural Center the John F. Kennedy Center for the Performing Arts and agreed that they would put money into it. And ultimately, the cost of this entire building was about $70 million, about $35 million of which came from the private sector and from foreign governments, and about $35 million came from the federal government. And uh, it was considered to be, and it was built as the living memorial to President Kennedy. It's the only living memorial to a president of the United States. Today, um, it, it took a while to get it built, I should say. Uh, it, it was uh, authorized in 1964, didn't open until 1971. So it tells you, you know, as you all know, Washington takes a while to get things done. The legislation was 1958 initially, and 71 is when it opened. It opened to a performance of the mass that was um, uh, composed by Leonard Bernstein uh, at the request of Jacqueline Kennedy. Um, we are now celebrating our 40th anniversary. There are uh, roughly 2,000 performances a year here. Roughly 2 million people a year come to the Kennedy Center. Uh, there's a board of trustees appointed by the President of the United States. And I, uh, fortunately, uh, I guess from my point of view, uh, were, was given the honor of being the chairman of it. And uh, I spend a fair amount of time here trying to help uh, mostly induce people to give money, I guess, or give money myself, or make some speeches. But it's an incredible facility. It has eight different uh, halls. This is just one of them. This one wasn't in the original facility. Uh, when, when, this, when the Kennedy Center was built, this was designed to be a circle, in, uh, a theater in the round. They ran out of money, and so they didn't build anything for many years. At the bicentennial, bicentennial year, 1976, the Japanese government, and to honor the, uh, this country for the bicentennial year, gave a couple million dollars to build this particular theater, and that's why you see various Japanese uh, uh, ornaments outside, because they really helped get this done. And this is, let's say, one of eight theaters here. The big ones that you often see are downstairs, and one where the Kennedy Center Honors is held is the Opera House, which is the biggest theater. It's an amazing story, and I never knew any of it, so, so that's good. <laughs> uh, okay, let me walk you back a little bit. Let's, let's walk our way slowly through this life of yours I outlined. Uh, so now everyone in this room knows you went to Duke, uh, but uh, tell us the story of how you came to go to Duke. Well, um, I grew up in a very modest family in Baltimore. My parents, uh, because my last name is Rubenstein, you might think my father was a lawyer, a doctor, a very prominent Jewish businessman. <laughs> Not the case. There are plenty of blue-collar Jews, I assure you. And uh, uh, my parents, uh, my, father my father dropped out of high school to, to work in, to, to, to do World War II. He, was patriotic. He dropped out of high school, I think, when he was probably 16 or 17 and somehow got into the Marines. When he came out, he met my mother, and, and uh, they got married shortly thereafter. My father was 20. My mother was 17 when they got married. I was born more than nine months later. Um, <laughs> and uh, my father worked his entire career in the post office, never made probably more than $8,000 a year, and I was their only child. I grew up in this re relatively segregated area of Baltimore because the mortgages forbade you to sell a home to somebody who was black or Jewish. So the, the, the blacks and the Jews had to build their own homes, in effect, or have homes built for them. They couldn't buy homes from somebody else. So the Baltimore it was a very ghettoized Jewish community. I was roughly 13 before I realized everybody in the world wasn't Jewish, because everybody I knew was Jewish. Um, <laughs> but I didn't have any real money, and I realized to get anywhere, I'd have to get somewhere, I'm probably in scholarships. And uh, so I, I went to a pub public high school in Baltimore, a large public high school there, and did well enough to, to get in a number of colleges. And I was an equal opportunity applier. Whoever gave me the biggest scholarship, I was going. Um, the night before, I was filling out, when I was filling out the applications, I didn't have a typewriter uh, or anything. I filled them all out in longhand. I had an application that somebody had given me from Duke University. I didn't honestly know the university that well, but I figured I got a spare hour, I'll fill out the application. Um, so somebody who can decipher hieroglyphics in the Duke admissions office could read my application because I, I couldn't write that well and somebody accepted me and, um, they, and then they gave me a scholarship and I said that's where I'm going. I'd never been in North Carolina before 
and I showed up the first day of school, and um, that's how I, I came there. And, and I was very happy. It was a great experience for me, and I'm uh, very grateful to Duke for accepting me and giving me financial aid. Had I not gotten financial aid, I wouldn't have been able to go to Duke, and I probably would not have been able to do some of the things I did. That's why it's so very important to have people in your admissions office who can read hieroglyphics. Right, absolutely. <laughs> Well, but it is, an, it is an amazing story. And when you talk about financial aid and the value, the, the, the importance of education being open to talent, you're a great example of it. So let's, let's skip to this next chapter. Uh, to say that you were partially in charge of domestic policy in the Carter administration when you were 27 years old, uh, I think part of what's interesting about that for me to raise the question now is, you know, we're familiar with these very depressing statistics about the number of people who think things are getting worse instead of better and, and uh, that their children will have a better life than themselves. Probably the, the last time in history that there was a, a, a sustained period of that kind of slide of confidence was in the 70s. I'm not saying you personally caused thank it. Thank you, thank you, thank <laughs> you. Uh, many people do think I caused it. Um, <laughs> what, what, what happened really, and in, in, in everybody's life here, in everybody's life everywhere, certain things will happen that had a little thing happened differently, your life would have been different. Had I not had that application at Duke on April the, on the, uh, the night of the application for Duke, December 31 or whatever it was, had I not had that application, I wouldn't have filled it out. I wouldn't have gone to Duke, I'd done something else, maybe I would be not in as good a shape as I think I am now. Um, so in that particular case, I had my, my goal in life was to work in government and do public service. I didn't have any money, as I said. Uh, I was inspired by John Kennedy's speech uh, in 1961, which is now the 50th anniversary of it this year, asking you to um, you know, do what you can for your country and not just for yourself. And so I went to work after law school for the man who wrote that speech with President Kennedy, Ted Sorensen. And he helped me get a job in, in government and uh, uh, in, in campaign. And I went to work for Jimmy Carter. He was 33 points ahead when I joined his campaign in 1976, and he won by one point. <laughs> so President Carter always said, what was your contribution to this campaign? But there was no answer to that, because I didn't contribute that much. He'd gone down by 32 points after I joined. But if you want a job in a White House staff, um, they're not often filled on merit, let's be honest. They're filled by people who often work in campaigns, and I had worked in a campaign, and my boss became the domestic policy advisor, and I became the deputy. And I, you know, here I am, 27 years old. I got an office in the West Wing of the White House. I'm going on Marine One, Air Force One, and you know, three years you, out of law you school. You were the Reggie Love of earlier I, days. It was great. <laughs> You're right. As I say, I wasn't qualified for that job three years out of law school, but President Carter wasn't qualified either, I thought. So, you know, um, you know he'd only been governor four years. So it was, it was great, but unfortunately, one of my jobs was to fight inflation, and I got it to 19%. Very difficult to do that. Um, so as you suggested earlier, um, you know, people used to come and say, you're a brilliant young man, and when you want a job, call me. So the day after we lost the election, yeah. I started calling people, and most of them never called me back. So as I reminded, you know, as Harry Truman said, if you want a, a friend in Washington, get a dog. And I couldn't get a job. I, you know, I, I'd gone to a good law school. I'd done well in college. But nobody wanted to hire a person whose expertise was telling them how the Carter White House worked. So, um, <laughs> so I, you know, I had to, I had to uh, and many of you may have done this, so I had to rebuild my career. It was somewhat deflating. I had been... Um, you know, in a high track performance in a good law firm in New York. I, I had worked in the White House. I had been dealing with presidents of the United States and, and other senior people. And then uh, a couple months later, I'm looking for a job and it took me many, many months to find one because no law firm really wanted to hire me. I had to pretty much start again. And, um, you know, I, I got lucky and when I started my firm, uh, uh, Carlisle, it, it took off. But, you know, if I hadn't either left to start the firm or if I had been a great lawyer, I wouldn't well, be here. If well, I had been so a great lawyer, I would be. I would still be practicing law, and I wasn't that good a lawyer. S slow down a minute. Uh, <laughs> the way that last sentence unfolded, right. like you were having to look for a job, and right. then I started my firm, and then like, well, okay. No, so well, I, well, can, you, I can you just take us back? <laughs> well, I, I, I went to practice law, and to be honest, I wasn't that good as a lawyer. Lawyers, and many of you are lawyers here, um, you have to pay attention to every detail. You have to really want to be an advisor. When I was in the White House, I was saying, this is what the president's going to do. This is the policy of the government. And, and I was a principal. Now I was back being an advisor, and I didn't really like it that much, and I wasn't that good at it. And so I, um, 
you know, the skills that you learn as a lawyer, as a young person, I didn't learn them because I was in the White House when I should have been learning those skills. So I ultimately, um, you know, I practiced law for a while and I realized that the legal game had gone to a business of if you bring in the clients, you get heavily compensated. If you do the work, you get less heavily compensated. So I spent a lot of time trying to bring in clients, but I didn't really enjoy it. And so I, uh, on a, on a, I just decided to start a buyout firm. There hadn't been one in Washington, D.C. I recruited people who knew something more about finance than I did, and, and it took off, and we got we, we were lucky. But had I not done that, I'd be practicing law probably. And again, if you're great at what you do, you probably will stay doing it. I wasn't that great at it. And also, if you love what you're doing, you won't have time to do something else. I didn't love practicing law. I love what I'm doing now. And my theory is people who accomplish great things in life are people who love what they're doing. If you don't really want to go to work every day and what you're doing, you should do something else because you're never going to accomplish anything great. Today, Steve Jobs, uh, uh, you know, we read about his death. He was a person who loved what he was doing. And other great entrepreneurs love what they're doing, and that's why they achieve greatness. And if you don't really love what you're doing, you should maybe look at doing something else if it's realistic to do so because you won't really, uh, toward the end of your life, uh, feel happy about what you've done if you really didn't take chances to do something really great with your life. So when you founded Carlyle, of course, there wasn't such a concept of Car as Carlyle right. as we know it nowadays. So that's to say, you founded something, the idea of which you really just had the, the smallest inkling of, right? right? And that's true, isn't right. it? Of course, it has to be true. Well, <laughs> in, in those days, in 1987, there were things called buyout firms. Uh, they were then called leverage buyout firms. And the word leverage became odious, so they went to the word management buyout. The word buyout became odious, so they went to the word private equity. Private equity is a little odious. We're going to some other name soon. But, but they, they were all small Benefactors firms. Benefactors of humanity. Maybe. Um, they were all small firms. That, and the, when KKR did the, the famous RJR deal in 1989, it only had seven employees. So it was a very small organization. Wow. What we did at Carlisle was we came up with two ideas that changed the face of private equity. One was we came up with the idea of having multiple investment funds at one time. In the mutual fund industry, that is very common. Uh, any of you who invest in mutual funds, you know Fidelity or T. Rowe Price will have m many funds. Private equity only had one fund at a time. So if you were in a buyout business, you've, you had your fund, you invested it, and you raised another when you were finished your, your, your first fund, your only fund. We came up with the idea of having more than one fund at a, at a time and then centralizing fundraising, legal, tax, accounting, other administrative things. Um, and then helping each of the fund heads run their business by freeing them up from having to worry about administrative things. And the second thing we did that changed the face of private equity was globalize the business. We said, well, if we can do something in the United States, why can't we do it in Europe and Asia and so forth? And that was very novel. So anytime you change the course of the way your industry is going, you have a chance of really uh, being a leader in that industry and, and, and changing the way the whole industry will ultimately conduct itself. And to some extent, we did that. Well, I would, I, I would ask you now, you know, uh, we all remember the E.F. Hutton a uh, ads where the, wi the wise person speaks and everyone leans forward. Uh, so I'll ask you a couple E.F. Hutton Of course, E.F. Hutton is out of business, but... Uh, <laughs> <laughs> but it used to be that when he spoke, people listened. Uh, uh, I, I'm interested, you pioneered this uh, uh, area of international investment. If, uh, uh, are, are you imagining that international will be the big profit center or energy center of such investment in the future? The, or, the, how, or how do you read it? What, the, what will be the big center? International. International. Non-US. Non okay. in, um, in 1960, the United States was 46% of the world's GDP. We were almost half the world's GDP in just this one country. And Europe and the United States in 1960 were more or less two-thirds of the world's GDP. Now, um, the United States is 21% of the world's GDP and probably going down. So we are not as dominant. The, the, the so-called emerging markets in the year 2014 will have a bigger GDP together than the developed markets, which I now call the submerging markets. Because uh, <laughs> Europe and the United States, we are burdened by enormous amounts of debt. We are burdened with um, aging populations. We are burdened with entitlement programs that we just honestly cannot afford. And with a, a demographic situation which um, is, is not really going to be conducive to high economic growth. Our growth in the United States is 1% or 2% a year. Europe might be 1% if it's lucky. China's growing at 8 to 10%. India at 7 to 9%. Brazil at 7% or so. So if these countries are growing at this rate and they have much younger populations and not burdened with debt, they will clearly drive the global economy. So all of us were lucky to grow up in a time when the United States was the dominant economy in the world and we had the benefit of a lifestyle that uh, came about because of that. Our children may not benefit similarly, and our grandchildren almost certainly will not. So it's, we're the first generation uh, that anybody can know of in the United States where 
the parents basically think that their children may not have a lifestyle better than the one they had. Usually parents think their children will have a better lifestyle in the United States, but now we don't because we can see that we are not uh, growing as the way we should grow. We have lots of problems, not to mention the political problems, which have often led to some of the, the economic problems. And so we have to do certain things with our economy. And so yes, to answer your question, I believe that the greatest growth opportunities are certainly overseas, and I think the emerging markets, so-called, have emerged, and if we don't invest in those markets, you're not likely to see the kind of profits that you probably would like to see as an investor. I read an article, and I'm sure many people did this year, by a person named Kenneth Rogoff called The Great Contraction, uh, arguing that we hadn't just been through a recession, but actually a different kind of event called a contraction, and that this is because the uh, amount of indebtedness or leverage was so large, and that those take a different time span to get out of. Uh, you probably have read this because I believe he's your brother-in-law. No, he's, no, no. <laughs> he's my wife's cousin, and he's a very interesting oh, person. Oh, he's your wife's cousin. Um, I don't know if my wife Same is here. Uh, she here? She was coming tonight. I don't know if she's here yet, but anyway. Um, uh, here's an interesting story because he went to Yale as an undergrad and you may have been there when you were teaching there. He dropped out of college, I dropped out of high school to play chess. He, he didn't want to go to high school anymore, he wanted to be a chess player. He became the national chess champion and one of the three <coughs> or four best chef, chess players in the world, grandmaster, and then ultimately Yale accepted him without a high school degree, graduated summa in economics, got a PhD at MIT, and ultimately became a very prominent economist and I think he's one of the best known economists in the world and written a book recently that I hope will ultimately lead to his getting a Nobel Prize in economics. Uh, clearly, what we have, what we all learned when we went to college in economics is this. Two consecutive quarters equals a recession, right. But I think that's an outdated concept because we never, in my view, got out of this last recession. We, 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 we emerged from two consecutive quarters of negative growth. We didn't have that for a while in 08 and 09, but we, we never really got our unemployment rate uh, back to where it should be. At the, at, the, at the middle of George W. Bush's administration, the unemployment rate was 4.5%. It's gone up to about 10.2% now, 9.1%, but that's a misleading number because the real unemployment rate is about 15 to 16%. We count unemployment for only, when we count people unemployed if they are looking for jobs in the last four weeks. So the real unemployment rate is about 15.5% because people have given up uh, looking for jobs. If we don't get our unemployment rate down, uh, we are going to be somewhat like Europe, which has a very high acceptable unemployment rate. Uh, it used to be in economics when you went to college, it was 4% was more or less full employment. Soon we're going to probably redefine that to 7 or 8% in the United States because we're not going to go below 7% probably for 5 to 7 or 8 years if we're lucky. We're just not generating enough jobs. And so we have enormous contraction in our uh, economy that's going on in the United States and the result is that there just aren't enough jobs out there. There just aren't enough jobs. And if you really want to get to know your children better, you're going to get to know them soon because they're going to come back. <laughs> when they graduate from college, they're going to be coming home again. There aren't as many jobs. When all of us graduate from college, we, can, we can take care of them in our old age. Uh, maybe. When, when, when we graduate from college, the idea that you could go to graduate school or, or go out and get a job wasn't that unusual. Today, it is not that easy to go to graduate school and get a job, or not that easy to go to college and get a job afterwards, and kids are struggling. And, and uh, very high uh, teenage unemployment, very high young adult unemployment. It's a sad situation for our country, and unless we do things about it, we, our leadership position in the world will, will decline. Now, we are the largest economy in the world, and we will be probably to the year 2030 or so. China will pass us at some point, and even then, as the second largest economy in the world, we'll be okay, but our relative lifestyle will go down, and our relative influence in the world will go down from what we knew as we were grow when we were growing up. Okay, so I tried to think of a question that I hoped would really put you to your test. Okay. And we come to just the point where I would ask it, which is given the world you just described, if you were starting out coming out of the Carter White House or whatever nowadays, what would you found now? Well, I, I, of course I would probably wish I had studied Mandarin at Duke. Um, <laughs> and I just read that there's a private school in New York that you know, starts at kindergarten that it's mandatory to have Mandarin. Mandatory, not optional. And more people on the face of the earth, as you probably know, speak Mandarin than speak English. So we, um, you know, I, what I would probably do is say, how can I find something that will take advantage of the enormous economic growth that's occurring in the emerging markets? As these populations grow and as their economic d uh, demand for products grow, and I would probably do something more internationally focused than something domestically focused. But I would also look for something that, that uh, takes advantage of the, um, the needs in the United States, if you can. The greatest needs in the United States right now, going forward, are probably going to be health care, 
Uh, when I was in the White House, 3% of the GDP of the United States was spent in health care. Today, that percentage is about 18 or 19 percent. And the baby boomers are spending an enormous amount of that money. Uh, my generation is beginning to retire. And as the baby boomers, the wealthiest generation in their country, is beginning to retire, they will spare no expense on artificial hips, artificial knees, plastic surgery, assisted living, whatever it takes. So health care will be an area of growth. Energy will be a great area. As much as I love renewable energy, uh, in our lifetime, carbon energy is going to still uh, dominate the global energy scene and the American energy scene. And as demand for energy increases, and it will around the world, our ability to exploit more carbon energy sources in the United States will be an attractive area. And then third, I would say agribusiness and food-related things, because we now have 6.9 billion people on the face of the earth. In about 25 years, we'll have 9 billion people, increasing by a third. The demand for food supplies is going to be staggering, and the demand for, for um, things related to uh, commodities is also going to be staggering. Those would be areas that I would probably try to pursue. Let me turn and ask you a little bit about Chapter 3, the philanthropic okay. chapter. Uh, and I find this interesting because, of course, if we were to think back 90 or 100 years, everybody could name the names of people who just had the knack for business, who didn't set out to be philanthropic, but who, after they became so successful, began to try to think of things they could do, uh, social value that could be produced with their personal success. And I think of people like Rockefeller and a university, a foundation. I think of Andrew Carnegie, the, the Carnegie Mellon, the Carnegie Foundation. I think of James B. Duke, uh, who probably didn't become philanthropic until shortly before uh, he gave the money to Duke and the Duke Endowment. Uh, I think of Leland Stanford. There's, o there's other people. Right. Uh, and you must be conscious of this. Uh, the, the, uh, philanthropy has taken on a whole new life in the last 20 years, a whole different scale in, the, in relation to the rest of the economy. Yes. First, the word philanthropy is not a word that means giving away money by rich people. It's an ancient Greek word, or the roots are from ancient Greece, that says, means, I love human beings. I love other people. And really, its roots in Greece meant that people who were helping other people were philanthropists. Now we've kind of bastardized it to mean high net worth people are giving away large sums of money. We call that philanthropy. In my view, philanthropy is helping other people with, the, with your time, your energy, your money, whatever you have. Uh, if you don't have a lot of money, you can still be a great philanthropist by giving your time, your ideas. Right. So I don't like these long lists of people who are great philanthropists by giving, measuring the amount of money they give away, because they're people who are giving their time and energy who, and ideas who might be just as valuable in helping them make the world a better place. In the case of people who have gotten fortunate or unfortunate to have a lot of money, and I say unfortunate because while everybody aspires to have a lot of money theoretically, um, you know, they're more tortured billionaires than, than you can possibly imagine. A lot of people You're have breaking money. my heart. Right, right. <laughs> they're, 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 the psychiatrist's couches are filled with them. Um, and uh, what you find when you have more money than you can spend is I've realized that I, I've now reached that position. You can only do two things with it, really. You can um, you know, spend your money or you can give it away. I mean, you can invest it to get more money to spend or give it away, but you can't do what the ancient Egyptians tried to do, which is to be buried with it. There's no evidence that being buried with it, you actually need it in the afterlife. So, <laughs> so as I realized I had more money than I really needed and my children really needed, I decided to try to do some things in philanthropy. My theory was, uh, one, I didn't want to be buried with it. Two, uh, I think that if you wait till your deathbed and say, you know, I've got a lot of money and here's the money and some executor give it away, it's not that much fun to do it that way. And there are many wealthy people who give away absolutely nothing. And in their will, it turns out that they've given it all away to something good. And a perfect example in this city is Jack Ken Cook, who was not, no tour, who was not famous for giving away a lot of money when he, when he was alive. When he died, he left several billion dollars, and now it's a very good foundation for education, for scholarships. I wish he had done it when he was earlier, uh, or when he was alive, and he could have seen the benefits of it. My theory on philanthropy is two, three things. One, if you give away money, it helps you psychologically, and it makes you feel better, because you feel better. Nobody ever gives given away money or given away other things in philanthropy and said, geez, I feel bad for having given away money. I feel bad for having helped any other people. Nobody ever says that. And by feeling good, you might actually live longer because, you know, your body might be, you know, all the bad spirits will be taken out. Second, you know, when John McEnroe was a tennis player, he was taught by Harry Hopman, a very famous tennis coach from Australia. And Hopman said, look, if the ball is out of your reach, try to get it if you can, you know, stick out your racket, something good might happen, you never know. 
Well, my theory is if you give away money, something good might happen, you never know. Sometimes you give away money and it will be wasted and somebody will just do terrible things with it, but sometimes something good will happen and somebody else's life might be better for, as a result of that. So that's a second thing. Third, you never know. We don't really know if there's a heaven or not. There might be, but why take a gamble? So, uh, so you, you might get to heaven, but if you're giving away the money, so why not, you know, it's an option. You know, for business people, it's an option. So my theory is, you know, try to give away the money. Now, it's the tritest thing to say by wealthy people, it's easy to make the money, it's hard to give it away. And, you know, so I'm tempted not to say that because it's so trite. But the truth is, figuring out what to do with your money is not as easy because you want to make sure that it's done, something is useful, going to, it will occur as a result of it. And so, you know, there are many ways of doing philanthropy now, which is you have people who really measure the, the results very carefully. Other people want to actually be in, deeply involved in, in, in it is more than metrics. They want to be deeply involved in, in the, the way the money is expended. There are many different ways. There's no perfect way of doing it. But in my own case, I have very eclectic interests, and I'm trying to help many different things. And when you talked about the documents that I, I've given, um, yeah, that was an, another serendipity kind of thing. I didn't intend to, to buy historic documents, but it kind of led to it. And now I feel that as a way to repay uh, the gift that I've received from this country by being my current position, I want to give back a lot to the country. So I've tried in, in this city, for example, to give back to our country by doing things, the Kennedy Center, the National Gallery of Art, Smithsonian, the archives, places that are national institutions. And if I can give anything back and help then maybe I'm repaying a modest way my own debt to this country for what it's done to me. Well, let me ask you, it's, a, it's an obvious question. I won't uh, look you in the eye as I ask this. Uh, <laughs> you've, su you've supported cultural institutions, you've uh, supported museums, libraries, all kinds of things. Uh, and uh, uh, one of the things we haven't yet talked about is universities. Right. Uh, and I guess I would ask you, I mean, I find it interesting if you think of the famous philanthropists of the late 19th century, the interesting thing is how many of them ended up founding a, both a foundation and a university. That's what Rockefeller did, right. that's what Carnegie did, that's what James B. Duke did. Uh, what, what do you, wh how, do, how do you assess the, the meaning of a university as an object of philanthropy? First, um, our country, as I said earlier, has some issues. Clearly, it's gonna be challenged to be as global an influence as we were when we were growing up. When I go around the world, what people want to talk to me about most is not how our country's economy is screwed up or, or how we're not as hardworking as we used to be or how they don't look forward to the way our government manages itself. What they say to me is, can you help me get my son into Duke? Um, <laughs> they say, can you help me because I want an American education degree. Exactly right. Although the K-12 education system in this country, public education, is not what it should be for sure. The graduates, the, the, the undergraduate schools are the envy of the world, particularly the private schools. There are some obviously very good public universities, but the private schools are the envy of the world. In my view, I think they are a national treasure, a national resource. So I try to help a number of private universities that I have some connection with, because I think what I'm doing is really helping the country continue this great national asset that people around the world want to, want to uh, uh, get be a piece of. With respect to Duke, let me give you my perspective on it. Um, Duke was a different university when I went there. I wouldn't say it was the most inviting to me. At, at those days, Duke had a Jewish quota. I didn't know it at the time. It had a, a very modest Jewish quota. I noticed there weren't that many people who were Jewish from floating around. I didn't figure out a quota, but it was a different <laughs> university. And it was it, completely different in some ways. It was very Southern. Um, some of you may remember this. How many of you graduated before 1970? Any of you? Okay. So we had daily maid service. Do you remember this? There was daily maid service. These nice women came in, and the big scandal when I, my freshman year was they were going to cut the maid service back from six days to five days a week. <laughs> but only people who got the maid service were the men. The women were theoretically able to make their own beds. I don't know. So, <laughs> but anyway, um, it was a different university. It was called the Harvard of the South. It wasn't called the Great National University. So it was a regional university. It wasn't quite the university it has become today. And the reason I like to help Duke, and I'm trying to be involved in it, is this. Um, when people look, talk to you about yourself, when you eat, meet people anywhere in the world, they will say to you, what's your name? Okay, where are you from? Where'd you go to school? And immediately people make a judgment about you. You went to a good school or not a bit good school. And people make an irrational judgment. If you went to a great school but you're not that smart, people will think you're smart. If you went to a terrible school and you're smart, people will think you're not that smart. And so 
I, you know, I want to, when I say I went to Duke, I want people to say, hey, you're a smart guy because it's a great school. <laughs> and, uh, why, why disabuse them of that? Let them figure out that I'm not that smart later. So, um, so uh, the way I look at it is we all uh, who went to Duke are, have a certain thing that's part of our, our personality. We have our name, we have a place where we went to, to, to uh, grew up, and we have a university degree. And I think that you, by, by giving to Duke, you inflate the value of your degree. In other words, when I went to Duke, I wasn't, the Duke wasn't as good a school as it is today. So by Duke being so much better of a university than it was, people think I'm a better student than I probably was. Because they think, wow, you went to Duke, you must be pretty good. Um, and the truth is, you know, maybe I wasn't that great a student, but I, but I um, get the benefit now of it going better. Now, if Duke was going this way, people would say, oh, you went to Duke, uh, too bad. Um, so, so my view is what you should try to do is, you know, always make the best impression you can. And if your university is doing very well and it's on the ascendancy, people will maybe think better of you. So I, I, I kind of view it as, one, it's a great national uh, treasure to help a private university because I think they're great things for the country. In our own selfish case, my own selfish case, I want people to think I went to a great school because, um, you know, maybe they'll think better of me because they think it's a great school. And I also want to repay the debt that Duke, ha Duke has to me. I, they gave me a scholarship. There might have been other schools um, that might have given me some scholarship, not as much as Duke. And therefore, uh, by Duke becoming a better university, it makes people think maybe I'm better than I am. And by helping me get to Duke uh, at the time with the scholarship that I needed then, um, I want to repay my debt. So that's how I look at it. You know, it would be extremely interesting to know who gave the scholarship that put you through Duke. And we could probably figure that out. We're having a dinner in about two weeks at Duke in which everyone who ever gave a scholarship can come have dinner with the person who currently holds it. Uh, that's a newish tradition, but it's actually, it's, it's a wonderful one because it makes you realize as a donor, you're actually creating human opportunity for real people. And if you're a student, that this was not some abstract institutional fact, but a, an actual act of human beings, well, a choice. Well, as President Kenny said, victory has a thousand followers. I'm sure everybody will say, well, I gave the scholarship, I don't know. But okay. I'm just curious, so the people here, how many are Duke graduates? Okay, wow. How many people graduated 10 years ago or less? 20 years ago? 30 years ago, 40 years ago. Anybody more than 45 years ago? There's one. Oh, wow. 50 years ago? Wow. Okay. Wow. Good. So I, I didn't mean to insult the people who graduated more than 50 years ago, but don't you think your degree is worth even more than it was when you went there? Right. There you go. Um, okay. How many people, I'm just curious, one more question. How many people here never went to Duke but they're, they came here tonight because they want to make sure their child gets into Duke. <laughs> okay? All right, okay. There you go. We know your names. Uh, so here's one last question. Uh, you went to China this summer. Yes. You, uh, uh, you know, of course, we have this basketball team this year that has, like, no seniors uh, and mostly <laughs> freshmen. You have seen them, and very few of us have. Uh, would you like to give your personal prognostication? Yes. <laughs> and I'll well. just say one thing before you answer this question which is, uh, you having bought the Magna Carta, I tried to interest you in buying Naismith's handwritten original manuscript of the rules of basketball. And you tried, you're that I, good a I, guy. Well, I'll answer, tell you what happened on that. First, how many people here think that Mike Krzyzewski could go to the reflecting pond and walk on the water there? <laughs> um, James Naismith wrote out the rules of basketball. His family decided to sell it. It went up for sale in, all, in, in Sotheby's. They said it would cost you know, uh, let's say under a million dollars or something. And so I thought it would be good to buy it and give it to Duke and put it in the Duke Hall of Fame or something like that. So I went up there and I'm, I said, I'll bid. And I'm starting to bid and every $100,000, there's somebody bidding against me. So 500,000, 600,000, it's going up. It's like $5 million. It's going up every, so I said, geez, who is this guy I'm bidding against? It was like, uh, you know, Butch Casting the Sundance Kid. Who is that guy that's bidding against? And I don't know who it was. So Finally, I said at about $5 million, he's, I like Mr. Naismith, I like Duke, but I didn't think it was worth that much for a, one sheet of paper about basketball rules. So finally, uh, I lost, and the guy who bought it for like $5.5 million or something, and it turns out it was a friend of mine who went to the University of Kansas, and he was betting it there because Naismith taught there. But anyway, I said to him earlier, why didn't you tell me you were interested? We could have bought it for a lot less together and shared it. <laughs> but, but, uh, okay, we saved a lot of money. Um, but and the, and the basketball team in, in China, um, and I should say, I preface what I say, uh, you should prep, uh, understand, I was on an intramural basketball team at Duke briefly, 
uh, there were only four other people on the team, and I got cut from that team. <laughs> so my basketball knowledge is limited. But um, it's obviously a young team. Um, it's, it, you know, they won the three games that I saw in China, and they won the game in Dubai. Uh, it, 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 it's, it, I don't know if it is going to be the best team the Dukes ever had. The preseason uh, magazine seem to say it's number five or six in the country. It's certainly a very good team. But you should never underestimate a team that Mike Krzyzewski is coaching. And um, I think the new player, um, Austin Rivers, is, is obviously an impact player and will be a, a great, hopefully, Duke player for four years, but certainly for one year or more. But, uh, <laughs> but uh, it's a terrific, uh, terrific team. And I, I, what Dick was referring to earlier was that Yao Ming came to one of the uh, receptions, and he is literally the biggest human being I've ever seen. Uh, he was seven, he's seven foot six. And so I had a picture taken, and it's like I look like, you know, I'm here, and he's like here. I, so I thought you'd had yourself shrunk in the picture. <laughs> so I, I emailed looked, it to you Dick. You look just like mini-me. Right, it was right. <laughs> so I emailed it to Dick, and about 10 minutes later, he emails back a thing to me. It shows that I'm actually bigger than him. He has Photoshopped it somehow. I don't know what. <laughs> so, uh, but anyway, uh, the Duke team, and I would say uh, when I was there, two impressions came home. One, very, very, a great many people knew about Duke. Now, I don't know if it's because Mike Krzyzewski was the coach of the Olympic team there or because uh, Yao Ming is the most popular person there and he is, was in the NBA and the NBA has more Duke players than it does players from any other one college. I don't know what the reason is, but everybody seemed to know and respect Duke and it made me feel good that Duke is so well known in China and our effort in Kunshan is making Duke even better known because we're going to be the first uh, university in, in the United States to actually do something like that in China and it will help globalize Duke. You know, Duke has been, when I was at Duke, it was a very regional school, and going you know, to Chapel Hill was a long way away sometimes. Now we're everywhere in the world, and I think it gives Duke the chance to be a great 21st century university. In the 21st century, the great universities will be not just in Durham or Chapel Hill or Ann Arbor. They will be all over the world with these incredible brand names and providing information in person and online. And I think Duke can be one of the leaders in that. And that's one of the reasons why I really think the project in China that you're supported in and led is, is, is very helpful to Duke. Well, this is a great guy. Thanks, David. Thank you. At the Kennedy Center, when that, there's that much applause, usually the person does an encore. Right, so... Uh, <laughs> uh, we take two or three questions, and then we're going to be all out. We'll all be outside. We have plenty uh, of food uh, outside general, afterwards. For general discussion. Is there? Who wants to know there's how they picked the Harsha. Kennedy Center honors? Harsha. Secondly, you always modestly talk about failing yourself into success. What did you learn at Duke that got you over those humps? Humility. Um, my observation of people is that the, the most talented people in the world are actually pretty humble about their own abilities. When people brag and they're arrogant and they're um, yelling at people and they treat their subordinates terrible by... Um, reminding them that they're subordinates. I think that's not a good standard. And so when I went to Duke, I realized I wasn't as smart as I thought I was. I didn't have the skills that I thought. So I learned a fair amount of humility. And I also learned how to deal with people of different backgrounds because I, it was a much different school than the one I had uh, come from. So I, I think just learning how to deal with other people and you know, the humility that I, you try to get from um, experience where you, you realize you're not as good as you want to be, but you tried hard. And uh, in terms of manufacturing, we have to be realistic. Uh, manufacturing is a business or an activity where the lowest cost producer is generally going to win. And the lowest cost producer is going to have the lowest labor cost and, and related kinds of things. And for, for the foreseeable future, we're just not going to have that in the United States. So we might in certain areas be very good, but we cannot compete in pure manufacturing with low cost manufacturing countries. So our, we have to either manufacture real value added products like maybe semiconductors or some parts of semiconductors or other kinds of things that, that really have some intellectual content that's beyond just manufacturing a, a same thing over and over again. 
And uh, I think we have to redesign our economy so we don't see manufacturing as the only way to grow as our way out of the uh, economic malaise that we're in now, to use a phrase from the 1970s. Are you, are you the person who invented the malaise speech? Um, actually, President Carter never actually said malaise, but it felt like malaise. And for all of you who didn't live through that era, what we did is we said, please, we know we have economic problems, but please give us a governor from a, uh, a Western state that isn't taken very seriously, isn't that smart, um, and, and really doesn't understand all the policies and important things in Washington. Give us that, because we can beat that governor. And uh, so you've got to be very careful when you're in the White House, because you tend to think that you're smarter than everybody else, and you never know what's going to happen. We never thought we'd lose the Ronald Reagan malaise or, or anything else aside. So we did have real economic problems. And it was the beginning of the recognition in the United States that we have such severe economic problems, and unless we do certain really important things, we're going to be gradually on a, on a plane that isn't very uh, acceptable to us. And uh, then we had this very high inflation and other problems. But it, I, I'm reliving a lot of my past when I see what's happening now in the White House, because the White House is a bit isolated. When you work in the White House, you say to yourself, um, I get all the best information so I can make the best decisions. And presidents always think that. And presidents always say, well, if you're so smart and about your advice, how come I'm president and you're not? And, and so it, the temptation, though, when you're in the White House is to think you know more than anybody else, but the truth is you often are so isolated that you really don't know more than anybody else. And everybody told me later we had no chance of beating Reagan, and I thought we had no chance of losing, so who knows? I saw a hand over here. Yes, yes please. just now with the isolation of the White House. Right. And so as these debates are going on, as the super committee is meeting to try to talk about what a path is to have a sustainable economy in the future, how does the United States not become a submerging economy, as you speak of, and try to change that trajectory? Well, I will announce my candidacy tomorrow. <laughs> for, uh, uh, look, uh, uh, if I honestly had the answer to that question, I would probably be giving it to everybody in Washington. It's not an easy answer. You can't get into the economic mess we have, find ourselves in and have one simple answer. So I think the best thing we could do in the short term is for the special committee to actually come up with a solution that avoids sequestration, because sequestration will mean failure. So one step at a time, solve that problem. That doesn't solve our debt problem. That only deals with reducing the increase of $12 trillion we're going to have in debt over the next uh, 10 years, it reduces it by maybe 3 or 4 trillion. We still have an enormous amount of debt, but that would be helpful. But what we really need to do is, is give people a sense in the United States and around the world that there is leadership that knows what to do and is trying to get something done and, and that therefore the path forward is more likely to be positive than the kind of things we've seen the last year or so. The image we have around the world, that people have around the world about our economic and political system now is so damaged by the things that happen in Washington, that it's going to take a while to fix it. And I think the best way to fix it is to get the special committee to do something and the president and Congress agree on something that is going to be helpful to the economy in the next 14 months and not waste the next 14 months waiting for the next presidential election, because that can only, um, I think, uh, harm the economy. Take one more. Here's one. Well, I just have a quick one related to if you could place your investment domestically to try and create jobs, where would, your, where would you place your bets? To create jobs? If I was a government official or? If you were a government, I mean just, yeah, if you, if you were president, well, uh, I mean, if you, I, not even president, but just if you could, if you could place, even as a private, someone, as a, as a private okay. individual, where would you place your bets to create jobs? The history of governments or people in a central planning area saying here's where jobs should go is not replete with a lot of success. What I would do is jumpstart the economy by saying that I would, um, in, I would do it by tax incentives because that doesn't require Congress to pass a lot of things and doesn't require as much of a bureaucracy. I would incent businesses to say, if you hire employees now, pay no FICA or other related uh, taxes for one or two years at all. And um, I would say to the employees that they wouldn't get FICA or Social Security for those two years or so, but they would uh, have a, chance, a better chance of getting a job, in my view, because I think a lot of government, a lot of companies are now not hiring people because of that factor, because of the ex extra expenses. And I would probably, um, for one year or so, put a regulatory hold on some of the new regulations that are coming out that have scared business rightly or wrongly, but business people are scared about a lot of the healthcare regulations, the 
the Dodd-Frank regulations and other kinds of things, and I would probably put a hold on that for a while until we got our economy going again. Um, we, we have to really jumpstart it in some serious way, and we don't have a lot of money to jumpstart things. The most, the only, there are only three ways to jumpstart this economy. Congress can spend money, but they don't really have a lot to spend without increasing the deficit dramatically. Second, the Federal Reserve could do some things, and it really probably can and will do more things, but can't do it completely. But it's the private sector. They're $2 trillion on cash in the balance sheet of U.S. companies. They have to be uh, incented to kind of spend that money in the United States, and that's what we really should work on, how to convince businesses to spend money to create jobs here, and whatever incentives I think are, that can be come up, can be developed, should be uh, developed as quickly as possible, because that's, be, that's where the money really is right now to jumpstart the economy. So if you want to become a neighborhood captain of David's campaign, you can uh, right. uh, uh, <laughs> meet in the lobby afterward. Uh, this has been a very fun evening, and David, you just Thank you very much. Thank you. Appreciate it. Thank you. Okay. Produced by Duke University. Online at duke.edu.